Hello, everyone, and welcome to our third webinar in collaboration with uh, CRMCS. Uh, today's talk will be on creating sales excellence with Dynamics and Microsoft Teams. We've got two excellent speakers, of course, uh, Paul McQuillan, Managing Director at CRMCS, joining us uh, as, as, as per usual. Uh, but this time we also got Dan Munro, who is owner and Managing Director at PJ Vows. Um, PJ Vows is an organization within the energy sector and a customer of Paul. Um, so I'm going to pass first the word over to Dan to give us a bit more information on uh, what he does and what his organization focuses on. Okay, I'm not sure that's why people are on the call today, but we're basically a manufacturing distributor of equipment to oil installations. And a lot of what we do is customized. It's a product service mix. Um, we're in a, a, a complex stakeholder environment with lots of different customers involved in lots of quite large projects. Um, and uh, yeah, that's what we do. We're, we're global. We've got lots of different locations all over the place, which uh, is one of the needs for this kind of technology. But uh, is, is that it, Paul? Do you need any more from me? <laughs> <laughs> over to you, Paul. Um, I'm going to introduce myself. Yeah, my name's Paul McQuillan, as Timo says, and I've specialised in dynamics for many a long year. Um, and probably in that space, really specialised in SharePoint and how in things integrate together. Uh, and obviously, over the last six months, my entire world is still very much SharePoint, but kind of changed to Microsoft Teams in a way. Something we started looking at a year ago, but then really, obviously, with current events, uh, massively accelerated in the last six months. And really bringing sort of the background of that into what, how we worked with PJ Valves and then started working with Dan and his team in May to then look at how we bring dynamics and teams together. Uh, and really, uh, as you said, Timo says, uh, we're looking at sort of how we've done that and try to give a bit of, a, bit of lessons from what we've learned along the way, um, what it really, what it means for next steps with dynamics and where the, the whole Microsoft ecosystem is going. Awesome. And uh, before I move on to uh, our intense questioning, um, I, I believe that for the next 20 minutes, you guys will kind of give us a bit more insights what you've been up to. Uh, to, together in the last uh, few months and what you've achieved and, and you know, how, how the project is progressing? Mm. Well, I think uh, I'll lurch straight in there, really. I mean, I, I started working with Dan in May um, in the PJ Vals team, but a little bit before that, uh, really, not so much entirely due to COVID, but a lot of things with Teams kind of occurred to me last year, just how much overlap there's going to be with SharePoint and how you know, my team have worked with SharePoint for donkey's years to bring the products together. Uh, how much overlap was going to be teams. So we had a bit of a roadmap of what we we're going to do with teams. And then March happened. Um, and then suddenly the entire planet, I know the Microsoft adverts get a bit irritated now, but we're all living on teams. But teams sort of took over. We massively accelerated what we were doing. A lot of it was internally based initially. It was all, like, well, how do we manage teams? We do daily stand-up calls. We do a bit of planner. But we also use dynamics. How do planner and dynamics work together? Well, they don't. Um, and then oh, they don't at the moment, but Microsoft are changing their ways there. But looking at that, and then we started looking at how a lot of our different clients would work with Teams. And we built the products before we really had anybody using it yet. But then what happened is we sort of started doing the product and we started talking about it more and we started blogging about it more. We met a few companies, um, and Dan and PJ Valls being one, of how we could roll it out. And then really from probably May, May this year, I think probably a little bit in April, but mostly May, we started rolling it out and learning how people want to use Teams. Um, and the guys at PJ are really good with technology, in my opinion. They're really good at, at learning and, and grasping. You know, they already use Teams, they already use Dynamics. They just were looking to bring the two together, where a lot of people I've worked with don't haven't you know don't know how to use Teams yet. Um, and really, so we kind of worked with them to integrate two systems. And we learned what our technology did out the box, which was good, but obviously a bit theoretical. And then learn how to bring that into practice and learn the options that Microsoft could give us. And really the big bit though, and the big bit I think we'll probably focus on today is what the benefits you get out of it and how to do it properly. Because we've been a bit on that learning curve of learning how businesses really use Teams versus what the technology is capable of and how you bring those two things together. And, and so from May, we sort of looking at that with PJ Valves, rolled it out in June. And then I've gone live with it and then carried on learning really between June, July and August and getting getting it getting it done right. And then uh, I suppose down so I'm coming heavily coming from my little sort of technical background there, but you can uh, give more of the business end experience of that one. 
Yeah, so we, we, we use Teams a lot and we've used Teams for the last uh, five years or four years or however long it's been out. And we've basically used it as a video platform and as an information sharing platform. But as as we with lots of businesses, it's great to use it all. It's where it goes. It's It's those conversations that are really creative, but not really going anywhere. And that's where we brought in CRM, obviously. Awesome. Do you want to take over? And then, really, I mean, I think the big challenge that I found with it, well, I found sort of a bit where Teams is brilliant at chat and collaboration. Like the chat in Teams is just way better than anything in CRM. I think we saw with PJ, they were using posts quite a bit in CRM where you would use a post, you'd link it to a few people or contacts or companies. But it didn't really go anywhere. You know, I mean, it was just, oh, I was a post in CRM, it's in the database brilliant what happens next well as much as i love crm not that much um you know it's not an activity you don't finish it you just kind of log in it. it's a bit like notes but notes where you tag people the big benefit with teams as simple as it sounds once you tag somebody they get a notification and they're involved in that conversation or that chat or that task or that project and that gives teams just such a massive element of collaboration that crm doesn't really have um, with my Microsoft hat on, Microsoft have tried various things to get that collaboration in CRM. There's a bit of Yammer, there's a bit of Posts, there's a bit of uh, task management, but they never quite done it in the way that Teams does it. Teams has brilliant meeting room functionality, brilliant chat functionality. Teams is a proper collaboration tool in a way that CRM debatably often isn't. And it, but CRM does stuff that Teams just doesn't like. Teams doesn't have any concept of your business processes. It's not that fuss work, which is a step in a sales journey you're at. CRM does. You can build a proper sales process. You can build, you know, like a workflow that flows tasks between people. And so CRM really it does, you know, if you're going to keep things organized, CRM and Dynamics is still going to be your go-to system for what you do. And it's your go-to database. But how do you get proper collaboration in there? And I think when we first got in contact with Dan and the PJ Vals team, where they're up to was you had CRM one place and they've done quite a lot of good work in CRM. I picked up a lot of CRM systems and um, I picked up a lot worse. So I think CRM there was doing pretty well. Um, wasn't like 600 fields all named field one, field two, which I may have seen in the past. Um, so it's a pretty good CRM system and you had a pretty, really strong uptake in Teams, which as I said, at that time is a little bit sort of rare in some ways. A lot of people are figuring out Teams at that point. But how do you join them together? There was a lot of stuff happening in Teams that just had no impact in CRM whatsoever. And there's a lot of stuff happening in CRM that had no impact on Teams. And you started to get, and Dan might correct me if I'm wrong here, a little bit of fragmentation where you got people who really like Teams, they'd run away with Teams, they'd do all this stuff, brilliant, and they wouldn't use CRM. Or you'd have some other people who go, well, I'm, you know, sales cycle and reporting wise, CRM is absolutely mission critical. So I'm not going near Teams because I want to need everything in CRM. And you get like different bits of the business sort of going off in a different ways. Um, and really, I think if I was being bold, I think the reason Dan brought us in was to kind of fix that problem. So that things happened in Teams went to CRM, things that happened in CRM went to Teams, and the two kind of worked in tandem with each other, if that if that sounds fair, Dan. Conversation to task, task conversation, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that that is the big bit, yeah, where you could have a conversation in well, you could kickstart a conversation in CRM. So you would do something in CRM that would be noteworthy. So like you might change a status of a sales opportunity or you might put a task in CRM, something that's noteworthy enough that it would then parachute into teams and then alert the people in that team who are relevant to it. So you have a concept of sales team or stakeholders that then go, Brilliant, if something happens on this particular day, here's what here's the people who need to know about it might be an email, might be a task, might be a whole new project. That goes into Teams, and then Teams does what Teams does brilliantly, which is gets those people talking about that thing, you know, that that particular thing, whatever it might be, three or four people immediately swapping notes on it in a way you can't do it via email. You know, email just isn't a collaboration platform. It's a, hey, here's something going on, I'm just going to tell you about it platform. Um, you can't do that via email, and you can't really do that through posts, and you can't really do it quite for activities unless you've got some really trendy workflow going on. Teams just does that. You know, people, you, you'd be amazed. I've done product demos on Teams and you, you just do a sort of thing where you flag up one of my members of my sort of members of my team who I'm victimizing for that demo and they will immediately ping back in the demo. Um, not because I've pre-warned them or told them, just because Teams promotes that proper collaboration. And I think that was the big bit. Things that happen in CRM go out to Teams and then you have the next logical step in that 
which we'd sort of done a bit of work on, but we needed to sort of like grow with PG Evolves, is once stuff's in teams, what then goes back into CRM? So you close the loop. You don't have a whole lot of stuff happening in teams. Brilliant bit of collaboration, people swapping documents, and then boom, where does it go? You need to go back into CRM, whether you're updating the thing, the opportunity or the project, or the big one we found was creating tasks or creating appointments. What's the next thing that happens? And then you've kind of got the clause loop, really, where a task, you know, in the, in the sort of day of a life, really, you have a task that gets raised in CRM, that goes out to a group of people. You swap different notes on doing that task. It might be that there's a particular stakeholder and supplier you need to liaise with, swap all the various different notes, close the task in Teams, and then create a follow-up task that goes back into CRM and the whole process kind of feeds back again. And if you're doing ongoing sales work of the type that Dan and his team do, that can be absolutely key because they're not, you know, they're not doing a, an opportunity that's going to be opened and closed in a week. You know, it's going to go on a, a number of weeks, a number of months, and there can be a number of suppliers involved and, you know, a client, a client with various stakeholders. So you need a constant sort of feedback loop of how you're going to manage that opportunity and that quotation, really. Is that there? Yeah, it's, it's the, you, you said earlier, it's the link between the, the relational database mm. and the conversation. Do you want to talk about that a bit more? Yeah, I think we're so uh, we're um, really. CRM's a brilliant database, but it is a database. It's pretty reactive. It sits there, you do stuff with it, and then it maybe does a few other things in response. I think what we found is that Teams is the thing that puts a bit of energy into that. Teams energizes people to work as people. Databases store data really well and they store documents really well, but they don't bring that energy to it the way that Teams does. And I think that's the the bit that we really found you need teams energizing people to do this and then crm capturing the process and the data as the outcome of those things and i think that was the the sort of proper collaborative approach that we found between the two systems of getting each system to do what it's good at and not try and turn crm into a you know every time you do anything in crm it pings you an email to tell you it's done it and at the similar time not don't try to turn teams into a database use the two for what they're really meant to be doing and then really energize a sales team to basically swap information, but without losing all of the actual good in data and documents and information that really should be going into a proper CRM system to make sure the processes are, are being adhered to. Do you gents have uh, anything else to add or uh, should we move to, uh, to our panel questions then? I think Probably add one thing with just almost like the, the journey that we've been on from a technical side. I think when we first launched that approach between Teams and CRM, obviously you're heavily focused on getting the Teams channels right. That's your, your first thing. You're having your channels in Teams map to the business concepts that PJ do. Because PJ work with a lot of different business partners. There's a lot of different projects within each one of those business partners. And the projects will effectively crisscross the people working with. Do you set up teams in that approach, which obviously can be a bit daunting. There's lots of different channels, there's lots of different teams and making sure we get that right. But then like sort of then making sure that once that initial setup's right, which is what our product initially was very strong at doing in, in May and June. And so get, getting that a bit, a bit done right through configuration. But then once you've got that, you've got the concept of sort of CRM posting things into teams, teams then posting things back into CRM, so we've got the closed loop. But then there's an awful lot of stuff we've learned along the way. So things like where Microsoft have put a lot of thought into how they do the Microsoft stack now, things like um, adaptive cards in Teams, where you're not just swapping Teams messages with maybe the odd URL involved on them. You've got proper adaptive cards that can then go, here's a thing, here's a visual, here's exactly how we structure what a sales opportunity looks like in Teams or what a task looks like in Teams or what a phone call looks like in Teams. Because then instantly you've got a visual alongside of that that then tells you quickly what's going on you're not just reading a block of text or a wall of text which obviously a chat channel can kind of look like and so i think that's one of the big things we learned probably probably in july i think where we sort of like right, right adaptive cards are the way you do this properly it's not all just chat messages and then the other bit which i think when we started off in june we were kind of there thereabouts we sort of knew that that was the direction that should move but we really leaned heavily into which is the concept of teams bots if you're doing teams properly and you're doing it in a way that's going to work, you need to have a concept of things people can do in teams, whether it be actions or chat actions or looking data up. And that's where you really lean into the bot side of teams 
not just from a techie point of view, what dynamics and sort of the Microsoft APIs can do into Teams, but then what people can do in Teams out to elsewhere. And really, I think the big eye opener for us was looking at how you could search SharePoint from Teams or search dynamics from Teams, and particularly then open new activities, close activities, and really expanding what you can do with that Teams bot into other systems. Because then there's not, again, there's that, why, why are you using Teams? You know, you're swapping messages, you're doing video calls, that's all very well. But what's the real reason you're using Teams? Well, it's because you can turn that chat, those video messages, those meeting rooms into then actions, whether it be the, you know, the example we touched upon of creating an activity or whether it be, right, I'm going to go and pull up a document or I'm going to go and find a particular piece of information in CRM in, directly in Teams because then the chat can instantly carry forward. Your collaboration has served many useful outcomes not just all right at some point i'm going to alt tab into another system and do something as a result of the chat the chat can be directly connected to the outcomes and i think they're the two bits that as we sort of rolled this out in june and july we really learned the the power of um and then kind of sort of you know sort of really saw what you can do with teams and a strong database alongside it awesome it was the flow wasn't it like it was oh. it was yeah, it's that flow of collaboration, I think. Yeah. yeah. The moment you break it up, and you have to break it up at some point, because you know, at some point people, people have to put the chatbot down. But um, you know, the, the, the longer you can keep that going, the more practical outcomes you get out of it. Mm. And therefore the better the bet you know, it's like a meeting where you've got meeting outcomes. The more structured you do it, the better you are, and the less you're gonna be redoing again when you do your next chat or do the meeting. If um if there isn't anything else for you guys to add, uh, we're going to move to our panel questions. Just so I remind everyone that has tuned in today, um, our topic is creating sales excellence with Dynamics and Microsoft Teams. And before we start with our first question, uh, I would like to uh, put a poll question forward to our audience. Uh, our first question states, the cloud makes acquiring new systems easier and quicker, but this brings challenges with governance. Which do you find works best for you? Uh, so I've just published that question. Please, guys, go ahead and answer. My first question will be um, to you, Dan. Uh, and I would like to find out what were the two main challenges your business development or sales team was experiencing from a process plus technology perspective uh, when it comes to customer and account management? Yeah, it, it's about, <clears throat> so I've had lots of days at team schools today and my, I'm sounding a bit uh, throaty. Uh, it's about connection, it's about stakeholders, it's about flow. So it, uh, who are the stakeholders? <clears throat> so I'm really struggling here. So I'm, I hope this isn't uh, more serious than I think it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and but how we flow through um, the value across stakeholders and across our team members as well. Um, I mean, you probably work with a lot of organizations. You work with a lot of organizations within the construction, the housing, the energy <clears> sectors. <throat> um, it will be very interesting for me to find out whether there are overlapping errors, whether there are sector trends, uh, when when it comes uh, to kind of moving forward uh, towards those integrations, setting those integrations between Dynamics 365 and Teams. Yeah, I mean, I see quite a bit at the moment. There's like one big trend, particularly, I don't want to mention the dreaded C word, uh, COVID, it's like the background early, but um, particularly at the moment where a lot of people are kind of doing a bit more with less, and it's accelerated what I think is the big existing trend where if I look at a lot of different people in sort of my backgrounds, heavily property and asset management a lot of the time, where you've got the concept of a case handler or a property manager or an asset manager. And I think historically, a lot of what they would do would be kind of managing the asset, but reactively. There'd be notes, there'd be a bit of chat, there'd be a bit of this. You maybe have like a, a weekly set of activities, but it'd be quite reactive. And really what a lot of organisations are trying to do is get is switch that around and make people proactive. So they're actually not just ticking boxes or just, oh, I need to do a note every week, so I need to do a note every week. Um, it's trying to make it so that that part is automatically done. Like that just happens by itself. 
and that people are using their initiative and putting a bit of know-how into what they're doing because that's the i mean it serves like two purposes one that's what people want from staff really you don't really want you know but box ticking and sometimes box ticking in the compliance industry is absolutely crucial but you want to be people be thinking about what they're doing and secondly particularly when working remotely people want to be doing things that involves a bit of initiative they want to be thinking about what they're doing it massive it's a massive asset to productivity and so really switching that look around where you go well i don't really want a disconnected team of people just fought blindly following some processes i want people yeah there's gonna always gonna be a bit of process driven nurtures to my industry but i want people investing in what they're doing and driving that forward in the way that they think is right and use it bringing their initiative in the picture and teams has a huge benefit to play in that because it allows you to collaborate on best process it allows you to say look i've got you know usually a lot of companies i work with have like a star performer he might have been there a short time or a long time but somebody goes my god these guys just do you know they manage properties or manage sales or manage something way better than everyone else and what, what Teams allows it to do is connect those people to other similar people to swap how people do things. And that avoids a lot of organizations I probably sort of saw in the double O's where they'd have a star player. The star player is somewhere over there. They've got a lot of obviously average or ordinary players over here. And the two don't really intermesh. Whereas Teams allows you to really kind of connect your, your different people so they actually bounce off each other and generate you know swap best ideas and so they operate more as a team rather than a whole lot of individuals who some of whom be good some of whom be bad and i think yeah teams has really allowed i've seen a lot of people in the, the sort of asset management industry particularly really benefit from that and that's the direction they're really trying to move you know proper collaboration proper reporting less massive forms so then you know the the output of individuals is more human less robotic and more productive as a whole and how, how much of that would you say um, is, is part of setting those systems correctly and how much of that it involves setting those uh, user manuals and, and, and involving kind of behavioral change uh, when, when it comes to, to, to the users of, of the systems? Well, you mentioned a dreaded word there in the user manual, I think. <laughs> user manuals, yeah, I don't know. Maybe some people have some different experiences, but I've never, I've never seen a particularly successful user manual. Um, <laughs> I think really the way people consume information now has, has changed really. It might all be our attention span. It's all about seven minutes long now. We've all become sun readers. But um, yeah, I think that really you need quick reference guides and even quick reference guides, you need them somewhere that's instantly accessible, usually Google, Googleable, to have a pack of information of how people work so people can find the answers at the time they want. And as much as possible, it sounds daft, but like I know it's particularly in tech industry as well, the more you can humanize that. So somebody asks somebody else a question and there's a quick answer to that, the better. Because people people prefer asking a question of a person or a bot. Or yeah, a, also, yeah. Paul, I think that systems shouldn't be like that. Mm. Systems should just be intuitive. If you're having to explain why a system works and how it works, you've probably lost. Yeah, it's just like elections, isn't it? If you're explaining, you're losing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> without getting political, yeah, I think it, it probably is. Mm. Yeah, but I think, and that, yeah, I think that's the other way the world's gone, really. Anything that's overcomplicated and hard to use to adopt probably isn't getting adopted, however clever it is. I've built some very clever systems over the years, but it's the simple, successful ones that have done the job better in a way. I, I sort of hazard a little bit. Some, some industries I work with, compliance particularly, have to have a certain level of complexity, and so you, you can't avoid it in some ways. But, yeah, you know, the, the more intuitive something is, the better. And the more collaborative, the better. It's where like a lot of support desks really are moving towards instant chat because it's just so much easier than email, which obviously was the, the previous instant chat tool of choice. But obviously email is just not interactive enough. Uh, but when, when, when you say like more, more collaborative, I assume that you also mean to what level of, successful adoption that system has gone through because you know those systems are only as good as the amount of people that use them and the, the amount of usage they really get so you know if you're not getting i don't know 30 percent of your of your team actually making use of it then then perhaps you know the effectiveness of those like drops significantly i think i mean it user adoption is all those big areas that people like me spend ages thinking about but i think in a way like when you look at the success of teams 
Um, and, and Teams is a massively successful product. It's worth just looking at the, the usage metrics of Teams. You feel very sorry for Slack all of a sudden because Slack invented big chunks of this, but Teams has just ran away with it. I'm sure Microsoft are very happy. Um, but like the big success of Teams almost is IT user adoptions are very well. But if you think of like, if you've got a good sales process in your business, right? You've got a sales process that works. You've mapped out some sales stages. You you know, you've sat down with that extremely well-performing salesperson, mapped it all out and gone, brilliant, I've got an amazing sales process. What's the next thing you do? Well, you write down a guide of how the sales process works. Everyone likes that good enough. And immediately it's okay. But in reality, yeah, it's like an IT user manual. People, some people will read it, and it's a good way of figuring out the you know, good people, bad people. Some good people will read it and properly adopt it. Some people will never go near it, and they'll, you know, you sort of gather dust in the corner somewhere. But the better way of doing it is just like in your IT system of going, look, I've got, we've got this brilliant sales process. We've got somebody here who knows it. Feel free to ask them questions. Just drop on the Teams chat or other chat tools, which tech chat tools are available. Or free. Microsoft got me an early age. But other tools are available to then say, well, you know, and say, well, you know, ask any questions. Just ask, you know, if you if you're wondering what the second stage step in the sales process is, just ask a question. And if you are say, if you've got a customer who's particularly hard to convert and you can't get hold of them, well, we've we, you know, we thought about this. Just ask us a few questions. And that ability to ask questions, whether you know directly via Teams or have like a Teams meeting, is way better to get people engaged in a sales process or an IT system or anything else really than giving people even like a two-page quick reference guide or here's a pdf or something the moment you send it like a letter like an email or a pdf the the engagement rate is going to drop off a little bit if you can personalize it and make it say well ask questions set up a meeting set up a forum set up a town hall it's yeah. so much more effective it's almost like building collaboration in the middle of what everyone does isn't it mm. and then it grows out rather yeah. than saying we work like this there's collaborative systems over here. Use them if you want. We start with collaboration. That's where right. that's so essential to what we do. That if we didn't, then we'd be half as successful. Oh yeah, and with my small business brain hat on as well. The amount of stuff that, particularly because when you start a small business, you you know you've got a bit of a learning curve all of your own. Is the amount of stuff where you start. Well, here's what we're going to do, and I'll push it out to everybody. And here's a user manual, employee handbook to read, yeah. um, and then you start going. Well, actually, if I can get people inside a business to actually exchange ideas on their own and get them do this my little favorite word democratically it's so much more effective than having some top-down structure even in like you know small business like mine is having the top-down structure of going oh, is this is this thing to read so you understand what you're doing um you know building a culture of a business and doing that through collaboration is a winner building handbooks of one form or another. it's not but also collaborating on a sales process is the same as collaborating on building a better it system mm. oh, it's yeah. the same yeah. it's the same mindset it's the same can we do this better kind of instinct well i mean i've spent years in the crm industry and the big one I mean, it's, it's not quite as heard as much now but in the double o's it was like IT, crm systems are not systems they're business strategies and obviously, when we said that in meetings, people would look at us and go, oh, what are you talking about? Um, but it's true because everything about CRM is driven by what your business strategy is, not and what the system does. Isn't it more a cultural thing, Paul? Mm -hmm. So when you came to meet us and you saw how we work and how we operate, you can see how you can drop systems on us and things like that. I think if you're going to a slightly different business, it would be a, a, a bit more difficult. Yeah, yeah, where well, there's... I mean, I, you know, obviously not going to name any names, but I do know a few businesses that are very top heavy. Yeah. And yeah, getting adoption, you know, they'll take six months to adopt a new system because it'll just wear. But if you can do like the sort of meetings I've been in with the PGA sales team where everyone's in, everyone's relatively engaged, everyone's sort of part of that process, you can adopt a system in a month, um, yeah. you know, not six months, which. So, you know, Timo, heavy. that's my point. So, so our sales processes can be quite slow, slow, quick, quick but it requires all these different people to be involved exactly like developing a good IT system and getting the adoption going. Mm -hmm. but, but I also assume it's a matter of uh, kind of two, two side uh, understanding of, of why things are done. While someone like Paul really needs to understand the internal processes and how those people work and, and where he can essentially implement those systems in a better way and, and integrate those systems in a better way. It's also a matter of having that team to understand why this exercise is being done, how it's going to impact their work, how it's going to make their work, uh, you know, less task heavy and more, more meaningful. We spoke about it earlier. 
done, where, where you said, you know, it's fantastic to have people see how their ideas are, are moving, you know, through through kind of the development tree of, of an organization, if, if you wish. So, you know, those automations are, are important and that kind of leads quite nicely to our next poll question, which is what's the most important thing you're looking for from a technology? The poll question has been uh, up for about two, three minutes now. We've got quite a few answers. But before, uh, you know, we kind of move aside from, from, from the questions here, when we talk about collaboration and when we talk about kind of uh, conversation management, it's not just a matter of putting forward the best tools to manage our customers, right? It's also uh, a matter of uh, managing the relationships with our suppliers. So I know how we, we spoke about the CRM aspects of things, but then from a project management perspective, uh, it will be kind of good to understand what were your requirements done um, on, on, on that side of the equation. Which Without meaning to make Paul speak more, uh, he <laughs> knows this very well. <laughs> Uh, we, when we looked at projects, it was really interesting because, as Paul said earlier, the need of projects is similar to the need of sales. It's about collaborating, problem solving, working together, engagement, uh, time management, team management. Um, you know, it's, the, it's the same thing. It's just slightly different aim. But the aim is to keep the customer happy as it is in the sales process and your third party uh, suppliers as well. So we... Um, when we looked at projects, we began, this This was quite a funny moment for us, actually, and I think Paul articulated this when we were speaking earlier. We began by going, right, projects, we, this is a great system. Uh, we do really good collaboration on teams with projects, but we're not there with the CRM with projects. Let's, let's get CRM sorted with projects. Paul can help us, no problem. And then the more we thought, the easier it became because actually the same processes we've got in sales are the same processes in projects. There's 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 detailed difference. There's data differences, obviously. And we we uh, during our projects we collect huge amounts of documentation and, and other information and manufacturing information, design information, which is really important to organise properly. But it's not in principle different. Uh, and actually, it's really important that your sales teams and your project teams are connected because it, uh, we we work on quite for us large projects if we don't impress the customer through the project it's really difficult to win the next project also we want to do a good job and so a lot of stuff we've learned in that sales cycle needs to pull through into that project cycle how easy is that when you're already doing it in the sales cycle you've got all your contacts in there you've got your communications managed there you've got your files managed there you've got a task system in there it's pinging across into teams so we can we can we can be alerted and, and the right sort of sales team or projects team can be alerted to particular bits and pieces how great is that now and the other thing that we talked earlier about adoption and sort of designing new systems and designing new sales process and i said there was similar i was trying to join the draw the parallel I reckon we'll have our project system from, we, we first mentioned this probably in seriously about two weeks ago, and it will probably be in UAT when? This week? Yeah, I think so. I think, yeah, we've got it in UAT, been reviewed kind of every week. Um, the team over there are really good. They're really good UATers, which I like. Um, and then I think, yeah, we'll probably have that sort of at the thought of final stages of UAT, probably within about another week or two. Yeah, so that, that's like three or four weeks from a, a, a very serious part of this business, a very important part of this business, how we manage our projects coming into the system. That's 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 great. And Paul's very good at that. The system's very good at that. And hopefully the culture creates the opportunity to to do that because people are open minded. They want to do things better and you know, they want to engage in systems. Obviously, not universally there. We, we've got differences of, of approach, but in general. Yeah, it's really rewarding exercise. When we first started it, it was a bit like, right, project management. That was our sort of brief almost. And the guys do have a couple of existing systems. And so you're like, well, are we going to use project automation? Are we going to need bits of field service? Probably not, but you don't know. But then as you got more into it, you're like, actually, there's a lot of similar structures that apply from the sales team, what we'd already done, into the project management team. And so in a way, we're kind of doing that sort of traditional fit gap way where you go, well, actually fit wise, there's quite a lot of stuff that just marries up. And, and the best bit is when we demo it to the project management guys, like, oh, that's great. How do you know we wanted this? And I'm like, oh, well, <laughs> it's what I prepared earlier, Blue Peter stuff. Um, obviously, then there's always other bits of other new things you want to play into the mix. 
but then it works quite well you kind of got that ability to roll teams into what i'd almost think of crm as like a platform system or like a hub system where you most of the stuff's going through crm and you've got different apps jumping into it but then you've got that ability to kind of move teams over there they get the benefit of having you know a stronger system stronger things going on the team's integration kind of out the box because we've already done that for sales so they get functionality they need but they also get that immediate link up with sales where like well we work the same way sales guys do so there's less miscommunication there's less stuff that doesn't go from sales to the operation side of the business and yeah that was really rewarding because when we first started off it was a bit like well we have to basically hook up microsoft project put some gap chat yeah. in they do all this stuff and like actually no we'll do some of that but a lot of it is going to come straight over from what we've already done with the sales team and hooking up microsoft project was not going to be simple or cheap uh or quick <laughs> well i do know a good company to do it it's not my yeah, uh, well, project automation server i can't claim was my expertise because i quite like having my expertise and not claiming the other bits of expertise but uh, i know some people who are very good at it <laughs> Uh, supplier management was the other point that Timo made, um, and we, we've we've compared sales and projects. And I think customers and suppliers they're just business partners, aren't they? They're just different types of business partners in the modern world. There, you've got to manage both sets of relationships. You've got to, you know, work together, share, you know, in a partnership style. In my view, so if you're if you're not doing that in, on your supplier side, which probably in <laughs> If I was going to pick up weaknesses for us that we've been, we tended to look at projects and, and particular suppliers, including our manufacturing, and you, you'd go a bit into one lot of project, one lot of suppliers for a project. Looking across at a supplier's view of your business, so you can see how they're working with you, you can see how they're communicating with you, you can see how that's working or not working. That is, that's really valuable and that's actionable as well. So you can look and you can say, hang on. We've done lots of work with this supplier. We're not giving them a lot of value back, um, or the tone of all this stuff with the supplier is just not right now. This, you know, the balance is wrong somehow. It's not how I, it's not partnership staff for whatever reason. You know, either me or one of the directors need to maybe get involved in that situation. That that supplier view is is as important as your customer view. And if you're both providing your manufactured goods and distributed goods, which is what we do, which is one of the sort of differentiators of our business model. You've got to make really sure the distribution side works, otherwise, otherwise it undermines your manufacturing side. So how we manage suppliers is really, really important. So it, it's just another parallel. It's just a slightly different dimension. There's different data sets, and obviously there's different ways of working in a, in, at the detail level, but in principle, it's about building partnerships. Yeah, I think that was the big bit that we picked up when we first put the team integration in, in in June, really. I went live with it in June, where yeah, you know, you're not you know, you're doing the, the sort of little bit the CRM holy grail where you're not just managing a relationship with a client, you're relationing them a whole series of relationship with various suppliers. And that is quite sort of something I was quite used to from the asset management and property background where usually you're liaising with a whole load of people, it's not just like you know, one customer. And yeah, CRM and dynamics is very good at that, um, in terms of you know, it's where Microsoft obviously have been trying to drop the C out of customer relationship management for a few years, where you're going, what do you, what relationships do you manage and how do you get value from them, full stop? And that's your suppliers, your partners, your customers. Yeah, I'm going to just bring one last thing to you. I know you probably want to move us on, but the other thing about the, the supplier customer, they're all people and individuals. And in this big world of collaboration, something we found with teams is it's fantastic to share all these ideas. And we've got all this energy here about good ways of doing stuff and helping our clients. But actually, if you have too many people who actually own stuff, who's responsible for driving stuff forward? Yeah. So that's where the work with Paul has been really good because we've defined sales teams. We've defined really clearly within the system project teams, whereas in teams, because of the way that the, the, the access structure works there, I'm, I'm not technical. So sorry if that sounds very untechnical, but because of the access structure, you have to give a lot of access to a lot of stuff, which means, you know, people, a lot of people can get stuff and go, well, I don't, am I, is that mine? Is that not mine? And and I think so. So you've got that internal piece of identifying who's going to be responsible for what role, but also into externally when you're working with suppliers and customers, you're starting to map those roles of people. And then you, you're going cross business. It, it doesn't matter what business you work for, profit and loss, of course, it does. But actually, to to get a successful outcome, you map 
yourself to these individuals in other places and, th and that's how you build value and i also think that's 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 future work anyway with remote working with all the partnerships that we're working out which getting value flowing through businesses you've got to have a really good handle on how you map those and that's what crm gives you through structure and then teams gives you through that collaboration piece uh, we use teams with um, with um, customers and suppliers as well by the way and, and are you yeah. able to use use that with all of them uh -huh. Or, or do you sometimes think you can taken out of it? Um, no, and uh, I think you know the answer to that one, Timo. But um, we've we've got some customers who are, who are um, who are more uh, technically uh, inclined to sort of develop their systems than others. Um, the oil and gas industry can be quite conservative for lots of reasons, mainly health and safety. Uh, but and that sometimes goes through into their approach to to, to IT. But Actually, I think quite a few people have been forced almost against their will to come onto the team's platform. And it's been fantastic because remote working, I mean, crikey, using video rather than just telephone. Now when I have a telephone, I don't know about you guys, but now I have a telephone call, I'm sort of thinking there's something missing. I can't see the person. I can't see the face. You know, who am I talking with here? It feels like half a communication, doesn't it? Is that true or just me? Yeah, well, I, when this first all kicked off, I, I wasn't really big on video calls, to be honest. I always thought it was a bit like, I don't know, just, I've never really got used to it. I got used to it within about a day with COVID kicking off, obviously. And now I'm totally like that. If someone rings me on a phone, I'm just like, oh, it's so weird. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Why didn't you email my internet device? <laughs> <laughs> when, 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 when you just said, Dan, that, uh, you know, people are being forced uh, onto team, I, I've, I've never seen a bigger grin on, on Paul's face, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Microsoft, I think I attended a lot of Microsoft conferences because they all went virtual back in May. So um, I've got, I've got my, I've been freshly indoctrinated. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know what? Because yeah, we went on early, I feel the pain of the people that didn't, and mm. and a few of the customers that that I I worked with hadn't, mm. and I've had some great experiences. One of them was um, I spoke to a really really nice customer in America, Houston. We got uh, piping a valve business in Houston, and I spoke to one of my customers, and he said, and I said, oh, sw switch on the video, and he switched on the video, and he was sitting there, and it was a really hot day in Houston. He was sitting out on his veranda completely topless with a little dog on his lap and <laughs> you know when you're not expecting something to happen anyway. <laughs> so it's, there's been some unforeseen moments and good moments of comedy from teams as well and actually that really ties well to to our next poll question uh, which has been like for, for a couple of minutes uh, when using technology there can be a division between the single system uh, versus many local systems which do you find works for you and as i said this has been up for some time 100 percent of uh, people have actually gone with the answer we bring different teams together into a single platform style system such as sub dynamics or salesforce so interesting one but i'm going to move you down on to the next question and that one is looking at internal communication management you know we spoke about the customers we spoke about the suppliers the project management but did you guys have any issues with regards to internal communication management and if so can you give us some example can you give us some examples i'm gonna i'm gonna sound a bit a bit overconfident about the business on this one but because we went into because we're international uh, we're not a huge business we're an international business We've been using video for years. I, and I, you know, I can go back for five years and one, one, of, one of my fellow directors, um, I remember a particular video call with him over in uh, Singapore years ago. And, and, I, and we've been working like that for years. So it, it's not been unusual. Well, it's not been unusual between leadership. I think um, the sales team used lots of um, video and always have done. I think in projects, video was, was less what happened. And occasionally I'm still on a call with, with a group of people and I say, I'm sorry, um, I have that awkward moment where I say, where I, I'm afraid I do call it, which is, I'm sorry, you're not showing your video, would you mind? Um, and now with Teams background as well, of course, that it's, it's, it, you, can, you can be private as well. But can I just be cheeky and go back to that last question about one system versus many, because it leads on to what the pool's doing for us right now. Sure. Um, guys get used to loads of systems, don't they? And we use SAP as an ERP here and hopping around between all these systems. And I don't have to do too much of that. But there's a lot of hopping around between systems. Something that um, CRM does really neatly now, particularly when you've got someone who knows what they're doing with it, like, like Paul's team, is, is the integration piece. So you've got your comms there, file management there, your workflows there, 
um, your stakeholder management piece, all, all that stuff in one system. Now that that if you've been hopping around systems, if you want a reason to work in a system, is because it brings it together and it does it without too much sacrifice. Paul, would you would you yeah. agree with that? There's not you don't lose too much usability or or power. I, I, I don't think, but. I think, yeah, nowadays with dynamics where you can have like apps for different things, it makes it a lot easier. Back in yeah. the day when you had like one big site map and everything was in there. So the more stuff you added to it, the more complicated it got. I think that was a bit of a limiting factor. But I think now, yeah, it's a lot better where you can segment different roles off of people. Yeah. Sorry to hit pop back there, Timo. What, what was the last one you asked? You asked something I, else? I, would, I was asking about uh, internal uh, communication management and I was wondering whether you know you guys had any issues with that but you said that obviously it's been a while that you've adopted teams internally and 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 perhaps you've ironed those uh throughout the years I think I think we've got we've won the cultural battle on it I would say uh I'd but I would also say communication is nothing without the action at the end of it mm. and I'd say some of the the, the really helpful stuff with with Paul and the technology they offer is it goes from that discussion to the action piece and then and then the action can bounce into another conversation which can lead to another action and you can give actions to other people uh, bits of the business are there other bits of the business aren't quite there but Paul will help us get there because it is it's really neat it's it's easy it's just there's no there's no logical reason to not do it the only reason you don't do it is because you don't kind of know how because the why is quite obvious you talked about why earlier team and why should i use this system it's 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 really clear but just so there's bits of the business that use the the, the these are bots aren't they paul i think you call them little teams bot yeah and the tech yeah, team bot i thought that meant something different but anyway so um it's it's um yeah it, they, they there's there's difference in adoption of, of some of the more advanced stuff but the basic use of teams video uh and crm is is is, is pretty good in fact, it's yeah. very good, I'd say. I mean, from my my side, so I've seen how people have used it because I see some of this technology is still quite new. So I see, so it's quite interesting to see how people use it. The big one, and again, sort of showing my kind of age with CRM a little bit. The biggest challenge with CRM, if you went back to it, went back a few years. Sales guy on the road does a meeting, really positive outcome. What what happens next? Do they update the opportunity and update the probability and and, and that kind of? Thing? Do they put some meeting notes in and do they put some next actions in? And the the the, the, the biggest the distance between them doing that meeting and them doing the follow-up, the less follow-up you get and the worse it gets. So it used to be that everyone was like, well, I need to see them on a mobile because I have to get this on the, they have to do it before they get in the car or they have to do it before they get back in the office. Or just don't make sure they do it before tomorrow because tomorrow they just won't do it ever. And the big bit, and that, that applies to everybody, everyone's the same, but people, line salespeople sometimes, everyone's the same in terms of the further you get away from whatever it is you're doing, the less productive outcomes you get. And the more you can stick stuff in Teams where you can go, oh, brilliant, we're doing various bits on Teams, we've done something on Opportunity or an email, it's in Teams, swap a few notes on it, and then you can carry on the outcomes in Teams, even as simple as just going, right, our little box called Doc Drive, you do app Doc Drive, race task, I need to do something, I need to do it next week. The more you can keep that in the narrative that you're already in, the more likely it is to happen. So it's like, right, update the opportunity, done. Raise task, done. Raise phone call, done. And that's when you get outcomes from the collaboration that you're doing internally and like that like i've seen this um, with pj and i see it with us internally as well where the more you can turn that chat into something productive the more of a feedback loop you're actually going to get to the end goal whether it be closing a case doing a piece of development moving a particular project on paul it's just interrupt you the, the you get to your end goal come back to timo's point about why do i use this system you're not sharing information because it's a good thing to do it is but you're sharing it because it will help you reach your goals better because you access the group brain you access the group muscle you access all this stuff it's how i talk about it with with the guys which is you may have a view on something and that view may be right or may not be right but you don't know until you share that put it out there surface it no one gets told off for ideas. I love ideas. We all love ideas. But there might be a, a slightly different way of looking at stuff. There might be a way of, of, of thinking about stuff based on different experiences and different approaches. So the key is to make sure that the person who's in that narrative, like in the old days, sales report was, was something that people had to do and it didn't really go anywhere. They did just sort of type it. You know, there was a someone typing it up on an old typewriter. That's so different. Now you put value in and you get value out, Timo, in sort of kind of like a, 
you know, in, in sort of a, almost like a trade thing. So even if you don't do it because you see it as a good thing to do, you do it because of self-interest, because actually it's going to help you achieve your goals. And, and I think that's, 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 that's touching quite a bit on my next question to you, Paul, because obviously we, we're trying to bring as much as possible within the same ecosystem of, of, of apps and, 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 and pieces of tech and processes. And, and we're looking at the supplier side, we're looking at the, the customer management, we're looking at the, the, the project management internally, but what does true collaboration actually look like? Well, I think what it looks like, going back a little bit into projects we've done in the past, particularly, you know, keep hacking back to double O's for some reason, um, it's a 2020 feeling, but um, like people used to say, our oh, living, breathing intranet, that's always the thing, um, a lot of, often a requirement alongside CRM, we're putting CRM in and we do a living, breathing intranet, and it might be in SharePoint, it might be in something else. And the problem is that everybody I ever saw try to do that project hit was content. What, where does the content come from? What on earth does a living and breathing intranet even look like? And a lot of people put intranets in place. They'll have somebody pushing it for a little while, there'll be loads of content, they will go somewhere else and then the internet will slowly die a death because the adoption's not there and the information's not there because you've got no way of other people feeding into it it's a top-down culture again where it's like we're going to publish stuff on the internet and then you'd have to train people to maybe add content to it or add collaboration to it and so it didn't really work i'm sure there are people who've got beautiful fully working internets but i've got i've seen a lot of them go by the wayside over the years but and so where i think like true collaboration lies is much the same as taking it to like consumer market, you know, it's where web 2.0 went to social media. If you can get people from contributing to the internet or to whatever it is that they're contributing to, it has a life of its own. And the business then doesn't have to keep on propping it up with content or propping it up with this, that and the other. It can actually come up rather than come down. And that's when collaboration works. When, when I've seen a lot of organizations are rolling out Teams now, Teams is your internet. It, you know, you've got channels, you've got Teams, you've got people to contact. The information's in there, particularly when you start then putting wikis into channels, putting apps into channels, start putting other things as well, even just links out to websites. Your teams becomes your intranet and the intranet grows by itself, which was always the holy grail of intranets. It's not some desperate content editor in a back room somewhere desperately piling content in to try and get people to engage with it. It's the, the actual, the business is building that intranet and swapping tools, swapping collaboration, and therefore it becomes its own collaboration platform. And I'm sure that's true with Slack and other things as well. But with teams, when I've seen teams be really successful, that's when it's really successful. Thank you, Paul. And uh, I just I just put up our next poll question. In the last six months, uh, have seen a huge increase in pace for technology, which best describes this for you. Uh, people have started answering, and I'm actually moving on to my next question for Dan. And it's really when you first started working with, with, with Podan uh, and, and things kind of got into motion, what were the key improvements you immediately noticed uh, after, after Paul got involved? Um, I'm going to try and say this without sort of just basically being too nice to Paul. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Paul, 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 in my experience of, of, of working with, with IT companies, Paul, Paul is rare in that he's able to look at business and see the te that technology crossover piece, which is so, so important when it comes to the kind of stuff we're talking about here. It's about business, it's about behaviors, uh, and it's about how people, it's about understanding the objectives of a business too. Mm -hmm. um, and so before I even started working with Paul actually or we even started working with Paul um, I actually saw a webinar believe it or not um, which was and I heard Paul speak and I thought crikey he's he's answering a lot of questions that uh, that we've got uh, we've got questions to and what's good about that approach is it doesn't just mean that how he del how he designs and delivers solutions is really good but it's he, he he gets it much better and I think there's quite a lot of the IT industry that in my experience which which it which just looks which just works with a piece of technology quite internally and non-collaboratively. So what that meant immediately was that when Paul turned up, he solved some just problems that our CRM installation had, which which meant it couldn't really really live. And so sort of released the value to it, and then very quickly brought online some really new stuff based on what we need. Um, Paul Paul um, Paul doesn't oversell himself his company or his products um so you have you feel like you have a proper solution conversation with him which says right there, there we are what can you do and how can you do it and and he does it and his team do it and so that that to me 
um, takes a lot from my brain. I don't have to worry about lots of that stuff. Um, and in fact, it's not just the doing it. I can go to Paul and say, we've got this problem and I'm really interested in hearing what Paul's view on it is. Rather than having to go further with it in my my thinking, I can focus on the other stuff I'm trying to do. So a um, bit of a roundabout one, but they, they've been a really good company for us. And we've worked with quite a lot of companies and we've worked, we worked with CRM years ago before we went off it and came back to it. We worked with lots of CRM companies, well, lots of SAP companies, uh, and almost all of them have that challenge between business and technology, that crossover piece. Um, it used to be called consulting. I don't know what it's called now. Um, but that's the, the Paul, Paul and, and his team are very good at that. Well, techno-functional consultant was always the best one I had heard uh, back in the day. It's become solution architects now. Doesn't that, like some, that sound like someone in Star Trek or something? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Terminator, I think. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you see yourself as a Terminator. <laughs> My business role model is Terminator. Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> sounds like, an email sounds like a sound business model. Yeah. <laughs> Paul, uh, I mean, I think that most people uh, would think that when it comes to uh, integration of those systems and correct implementation, we're mostly focusing on efficiency improvements. But is that really the case? Can actually the correct uh, process implementation, the correct integration lead to uh, increase of uh, revenue performance? Yeah, I think so. I think people like me will always talk about return on investment, but it's always a little bit of a misnomer because we go in, we apply technology, people need to use that technology, it hopefully has efficiency gains, productivity gains. It's very difficult to measure that in revenue performance. Ultimately, we, you know, we do our best, and you know, there's always a Microsoft PDF somewhere saying, "Well, 25% more more profitable." But in reality, it's always a bit like bulk marketing. You know, you point out they try and manage, man, like monitor the outputs and see where you go with it. But I think one thing is really eye-opening for me in the last couple of weeks. We deployed sort of our CRM, SharePoint, and Teams integration to a customer in North America a few years ago, uh, back when it was just just SharePoint and Dynamics. And for them, small, simple in a, in a way, it just tracks email attachments, puts them into CRM, um, put, well, SharePoint, and then into CRM through there. So it just takes a huge amount of email attachments and documents and gets them against cases where they sort of track all the engineering details. Um, so, and to us, it's a small, very small project, very small piece of technology, just clipped in there, use of Dynamics. Uh, the, you know, customer over in North America, so I've never really visited them or anything like that. And I don't know that much about them in a weird way. But when, obviously over this year, we've been kind of trying to expand, our, expand ourselves a little bit and approach customers and go, oh, do you want to do this a case study or tell us how you've used our product, um, which is something we probably should have done years ago, but we're all on the learning curve. Um, but they, they came back to us. I came back to a third party that, um, that, that does the case studies for us. And so I said, well, we use Dynamics. 50% of the productivity and so revenue we get from using Dynamics, we get from Dynamics. The other 50% we get from your SharePoint integration. And well, I was slightly staggered by that because this isn't a customer that I work with. You know, I, I probably swap the odd email with them every couple of months. Um, you know, it's, it's we just, we've sold them a piece of technology. It does the job. They pay a license fee for it. But to sort of get that feedback back was incredible. And it was really eye-opening for me because deep down, I'm a techie at heart. You know, I know loads of technology. So I assume somewhat naively or probably wrongly, the more technology we apply to a customer, the more benefits they get. Because the more work we've done, surely the more benefits they must be getting. But that's not always the case. Sometimes the the correct application of technology, however small and simple, can have huge benefits to people. Um, and obviously I'm all about Teams now. Teams is I'm almost taking over my life in a way because um, I, I absolutely love it to bits. It fixes so many problems I saw with technology in the past. But like that that story is quite common for a few of our clients who use sharepoint integration you know they just not get the sharepoint documents not do file management it's not I, I, I always try to sell document management in a kind of sort of it's kind of exciting way but you know in a weird way it's just kind of knowing where to find information and being able to find it easily but the benefits to a few of our clients who use that have been massive and probably far bigger than i thought they were if truth be told and that's been um yeah we've seen it direct correlation really between their productivity, their revenue, and what we've done. But probably a larger scale where we've done one and then the revenue they've got from that's like a five rather than, you know, three and three, which is where you sort of assume it might be. But then like Paul, when 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 we have CRM and teams working well, like what else do they allow us to do? Well I think Teams is gonna is a absolutely fascinating technology. Like for me, 
SharePoint can do lots of different things, but generally document management is my thing, metadata. So you know, I know what it, SharePoint does what it says in the tin in a way. Um, and as I said, my, my experience of intranets isn't too much. But Teams has got a huge amount of capability. I mean, even what we've done with PJ is sort of scratching the surface a little bit. Microsoft are moving into Teams in a huge way. They're going to have the whole dynamics and power apps architecture starting from Teams. Or you drop like apps into Teams. That's all coming down the pipeline. And so I think the foundation, getting the foundation elements of Teams, and you need to get the foundation and you need to have the right teams, right channels, right what's going on in the channel, because otherwise it, it just gets a bit lost in the detail. But then once you have that, there's a lot of things you can do. Like what we started doing with PJs is moving it into dashboards that present CRM data or Teams data back to people. Traditionally, you always house those dashboards in CRM themselves um, and so you can get access to a dashboard on a customer or a dashboard on a diary, that kind of thing. A lot of that can now be surfaced in Teams and you can have an almost seamless interlink between Teams, CRM, obviously SharePoint for the document side of things. And, and that is going to become incredibly powerful and in a way, it's exactly where Microsoft are going. Um, Microsoft are finding their feet a little bit with this one as well because the uptake on Teams has been so huge. But that's very much where Microsoft are going. And I think that's where a good Teams rollout that works the way the rest of your business works is going to be a massive asset to anybody in the future, I think. Thank you, Paul. Uh, and I will put forward our last question to the audience. Uh, innovation through technology. Timo, can I just add a very quick one on that one, By all which means. is we talked about efficiency. Efficiency is about people doing stuff that adds value and getting rid of the stuff that doesn't. So where is that file? Where is that bit of information? Automatic. You know, why, why have we got, you know, people looking for that kind of stuff? Systems can solve these problems and the system and, and Teams and CRM integrated does. So I, I see I see efficiency not so much about in the sort of old style of efficiency which is which is cost cutting i see it as more value adding so so how does each person here do add more value and that makes their job more interesting it gives them more earning potential it gives them more you know, value generation potential for the overall business as well and i think the the more you can bring in systems that allow people to 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 use their brain and to think and to feel they're making an impact and make an impact that that's that's got to be a good thing so i think for culturally if you want to be a progressive business if efficiency is actually at the base of it because if you you can't be spending your time doing the clever stuff if you don't have those foundations in place and that's what that's 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 some of the fixing that's uh, on the team side and the crm side that, that paul's helped us with so i just wanted to make that point about efficiency i think modern efficiency is different to old efficiency and yeah. everywhere you know, back in the day, knowing where data was and where documents was was good, was always been good. But now there's so much more out there. You know, we collect way much more data than we ever did previously. There's way more documents and files and pictures as well, uh, particularly in sort of asset management industry where there's, you know, literally millions of pictures. Um, knowing how to find that information massively increases how people work it. They're not you know, the, the bad old days of rummage around file shares to go and find something until you either A, give up or B, realise how much time you've wasted trying to find them, or better still, search your inbox. And even just that sort of simplistic thing of just having a consistent approach to where information goes, it's all predictably stored. And so people can just get on, find what they're looking for and do what they actually want to do. Yeah, I think that's been, yeah, again, it's, it's still quite surprising to technology people like me, you know, because so much of the tech industry is about AI and bots and machine learning, that kind of thing. But just having a consistent way of getting to information that people need to, it's a huge benefit. And, and obviously that inevitably translates to engagement and revenue, really. And, and Dan, you, you mentioned something earlier, which was quite interesting, which is kind of the, the quality of interaction, the quality of communication between team members. And, and when you have removed this aspect of asking others where is something, whether that's the correct version of it, like you, it was, can, can you elaborate a bit more on that? yeah um it, the, the quality it's like fake collaboration so at the lowest level it's not really collaboration mm. it's finding out where stuff is collaboration is where you come together to generate more value that's not generating value that's kind of doing something that a system should support isn't it so how do those people generate more value well you don't fill the time with those conversations you fill the times with the insights from those information so i'm going to pick on what paul said so structured data so having documents in a file structure that, you, that everyone knows where to get it great okay that's that's level a okay 
some levels up, you've got metadata on those documents. I want to search, see all this kind of document. I want to run some sort of process that goes through those documents and gives me an insight, which I'm then going to talk to Paul about because I know Paul knows something about it that's going to add value that might need a whole revenue stream from us, might need a better product design, might need another service design, might need something. But it, 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 how much more interesting is a conversation about product enhancement design, service enhancement design, or actually internal process enhancement design than, have you seen where that document is, please? Yeah. It's, you know, that that's my point, I think, that there's there's different levels of collaboration and that actually doesn't, because that, I think you were, used the word earlier, block, that almost like blocks the good communication. You want to get to the good stuff, you know, the value add, the, the, the brain of thinking. Yeah, it's a bit like we see with salespeople, isn't it? It's like, why didn't you update the opportunity? You don't. Nobody really wants to be talking about that. It's almost like no. do things where you want to be talking about what's actually going on, not you know, chasing people for you know, some tip box ticking. Absolutely. And 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 then were those things that you know you kind of like identified like earlier, or I mean, as you started working, like what what other uh, further areas of improvements did you guys collectively discover? Uh, so so what's great about building foundations like this is that as you're going, Tim, I don't know if you found this in your business too, but as you're going, you, you find more opportunities from it. It's like opening in a new country, you go into that new country and you go in there and think, right, this is what we're going to do over there. And you actually go there and start to understand it. And because you've got that permanent establishment, you go, oh, wow, we know this stuff that we can really do over here. Yeah, it's the same with building this technology. I think some of the stuff that we're, we're really looking to to get value from is is the metadata file management, which sounds very dry, doesn't it? Um, is that going to be your functional? Is that my equivalent of your functional technical? I think you're trying to find a good way of, of sort of describing how good metadata is for documents. But yeah, I, but I mean, basically, yeah, like, you probably, probably see my attempts. Yeah, it's tagging it's tagging documents, so you know what's in them, and you can run, you can you can use, use them intelligently. And we're we're doing some work on that. We're work, we're we're bringing we're bringing CRM into projects as well. Um, the, the, the next part is to bring that CRM into our manufacturing processes as well. So that's that's the next stage, uh, stage I think. Um, but who knows? I mean, I, I think something that I'm quite interested in is to see where the technology goes in the future and how we apply it to build value. And, and once you've got the technology installed, the, the, the thing that's going to put brakes on you developing new areas is not so much the building a new server get it because that stuff it's all cloud-based it's, it's actually about what works for the business number one and also user adoption and just being really careful that you're not doing too much at any one time and if i if i was going to criticize I, i'm 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 probably not very good at helping paul manage that process with, with the operations team here so i'm quite keen to get new stuff going you can see i'm quite enthusiastic and energetic and that probably means i, I push too much on people a little bit to, to, to progress because i just think this is wonderful why wouldn't you um so I, I think what we'd probably need to do is think about the way we do it on a staged place see what see what the technology is bringing but there's some obvious things that we've we've got lined up now to to, to bring value to, to wider parts of the business anything to yeah. add to that paul yeah i think well i mean now with my technology hat on obviously dynamics is very broad and you can do lots and lots of things with it, and that's brilliant but in a way you're almost looking at i need to do xyz go and find the technology and the people who are good at doing xyz and it's absolutely key like there's quite a lot of things that as much as running a small business and particularly at the moment all the challenges there are things that you go oh, actually i want to find the right people to do this because it might not be us you know you want to find the right provider who's got the experience of doing certain things um you know like i know like with when we're particularly when working with existing clients we kind of try and have a decent map of here's what we're really good at and not try and sell loads of other stuff that we're not really good at or we don't have the experience in because we know with things like teams uh, cognitive services is another big one we know how they work and we know the pitfalls that you get into and so then we look at other bits of technology that maybe we don't have that experience and we know that we don't know those pitfalls and i think that's a key bit where you look at technology and you look at people at what strengths they bring into it and don't try and use technology to do something completely different to what it's supposed to do um and don't you know don't try and bend it providers out of shape to to go do stuff that they might not have done before or don't have the requisite level of experience in. um there's always a toss-up between innovation where you're doing something completely new uh, there isn't that many teams bots out there yet kind of thing so you know you're always piling a little bit into new things 
but making sure that people have got the right starting point to get into those new things. So you're not just you know grabbing somebody and throwing them in the deep end. And and, and how important do you, do you feel the aspect of actually understanding what is the level of, of tech literacy of, of those team members? What, what is also the aspects of the technology that they're required to use? Because I think that a lot of people make a mistake with stepping in uh, an organization, trying to provide a kind of a linear training approach where you know you essentially go and you train everyone in the same exact manner you know the way that like i see technology i i, I see it really as a language and, and some of us are more fluent in in that language than others and the ones that are not so fluent if you throw a lot at them as you were saying paul as humans you know will develop a natural resentment to a process or or or, or a piece of product that's why actually in most cases a lot of organizations have uh, a relatively mediocre level of, of adoption uh, of tech like most companies say that it sits somewhere be, be between 40 and 50 percent really but how important to your way of working for is actually understanding you know individual members or, or groups of people and, and and what they'll really be making out of this technology i think you're always learning I, i've been learning my whole career on how to how people relate to technology and probably will carry on learning for god only knows how many years um because i think the relationship people have with technology is different um and so you've got to understand that a little bit understand the culture of, of a company and of people understand what they know and what they're bred into and then how where how what transition are going to go, go on to get where they want to be and i think that understanding is absolutely key i think you do you, you you know too many technology people like myself go in and go oh, it's cool technology and you can go here here here, here without really understanding where people are right now and you just lose people I think the biggest one that I always think a little bit is that I'm a technology person. I quite like new technology, but I'm like everyone else in the world that if I log on to online banking and everything's moved, um, I just instantly react badly to it. So there's no engagement there. I mean, I don't know what I, you know, Barclays, every time I log up my mobile app, I have to sign a new terms and T's and C's and I've long since lost the plot because I must have signed about 50 of them, I reckon. Um, God only knows what I've signed up to, but there's no engagement there. I'm not, sorry, not engaged. So once I've signed the T's and C's for the 50th time, and then I'm in the app and things move around. I'm just feeling a bit annoyed. But banks don't really need to engage with me on a personal banking level, so they don't. Um, and we, from the business environment, though, that's a disastrous relationship. You have to build a level of engagement where people actually feel part of that process and where innovation is a two-way street. Um, the industry isn't quite there yet, but the ideas around getting what we call citizen developers, and so bits of the development come from sort of hardcore techies and like myself uh, or on some sort of point there where it might be writing code or it might be customizing existing platforms or it might just be configuring things but it comes from a third party technology provider but everything you then feed into can then go into the business and somebody in the business can put that to use and they can feel that that's a two-way communication because then you've got some people in the business you've got a technology provider you've got the end, end users and there is a proper dialogue in that triangle rather than it being I know top down being always gets a bit of a bad rap, but rather than being a technology provider, giving a lot of technology and saying, hey, do this. And then somebody in the business going, oh, right, there's a lot of technology. We paid a lot of money for it. So best get people to do this. And then some users going, I'm at the bottom of the tree and apparently I'm being told very much what to do. And that that has been where you get that 40, 50 percent engagement rate and not much better than that, because some users will go, oh, brilliant. Well, I really like this job. It's fantastic. I really want to use this technology because I like working here and I, I want to be a team player. Off I go. Other people are going to be like my Barclays example we're going to look at it and go I'll use it if I must because you know you, the engagement the sort of dialogue isn't really there and, and and how much of that is it's it's really on on on, on you done I mean how much is it uh related to you explaining why you as an organization need to make those changes and how it's really gonna improve people's uh work in a positive way you're big on the why, aren't you, Timo? You as a person want to understand why. I, I think it's about individuals and I think you want why. I don't think everybody really wants why. I think you've got different personality types and we do lots of work on personality profiling when we bring people in and we're training people here. And there's different ways in which um, in which in which you, you bring people on board with technology, but there's 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 obviously ways not to. Uh, as well, which Paul's described quite nicely, lots of those that top down and this is what you get and many layers and disconnections and all those things. And it's all about that that functioning collaborative process, which I talked about right at the start, which is if you've got a functioning collaborative culture, 
you've probably got a functioning collaborative sales process and that creates the, and, and service process and manufacturing process and that that creates conditions for the introduction of technology because because collaboration means a degree of alignment doesn't it? it means the people collaborating have a degree of alignment they want a similar goal maybe not exactly the same but similar so you've already got them on that journey and i, I i'd end on a on a on a sort of positive as well is we're in the world of apps aren't we which means um, when I look at my phone, I don't know how many apps I've got on there. I don't know how many I've actually used, but I, I don't know. I've got lots and lots of apps in there. So is everyone else. And now there, there's a good side, which is we adopt new apps really quick. And how many times have you been to a, um, a car park for the council and they've changed their apps? Um, so we have to adopt our apps or the, you know, going to a train station or whatever. But actually, it's you do you do have an audience that's used to working with technology now. And so remember that we we are we have a high standard because companies like apple make good gui and and windows now is probably a good gui but we we do have is that not paul's oh, laughing is that? Now. <laughs> yeah. but like, no they do have a good gui and lots of other people do as well i've not used android but i'm sure it's really good too because it's been it's cracky there's so many people working on it but the point is that actually you've got you've got a generation of people now who are in a in a world of working with apps and systems and technology. I bet when they turn on their TV at home is a smart TV, lots of people, you know, so Timo, I'd, I'd be a bit more positive about that. I'd say that creates a, that creates an environment where people are willing to look a bit a bit longer. And I think I've been working a little bit longer than Paul as well. And I remember I, I remember the pre smartphone um, period and, and I remember um, when I when I became managing director here, and I remember the the challenge, the cultural challenges I had then, and probably half the workforce didn't have a mobile phone then, and and now everyone's got smartphones. Everyone in our manufacturing, in our distribution, everyone. So that that that's very different, and that does create a situation where you can introduce technology, and it's more about the winning the hearts and minds rather than the competence. Awesome, awesome. I, I'm. I'm having only one last question before we wrap up actually and it's an audience question from uh, martin pingelov and it's a question to both of you guys um and it would be interesting to find out how do you measure the success of your uh, dynamics 365 and, and teams implementations well i'd say it's two ways which probably reflects my kind of divided approach sometimes one way i would do it is i'd look at usage stats um i'm big big on my usage stats see how much people are actually doing and then what the common operations are versus the less common operations and that's the techie in me talking because you'd be like oh get a spreadsheet up oh well big dashboard these days um but i think the better way of doing it and as said, i've learned a little bit from from having people do do case studies because i'm quite I'm a bit i was a bit shy about asking for case studies from customers so why what we started doing as a business um this year particularly is getting uh, you know a different member of the team or a third party is completely disconnected from me to do case studies and that gets some really good feedback from people because then you get an honest appraisal of how how dynamics is doing or how doc drive is doing or what the technology is doing and i think having that kind of almost like system appraisal was separated from the original developers and ideally from anybody who's got anything to do the paid purse strings there's no vested interests it's just how good is it really and I think then you get a really good set of feedback on Dynamics or SharePoint or whatever system it is. And I think that often gets missed. You need to do it a couple of months after a rollout and really get that good feedback. Uh, and I think then you get some really illuminating answers. Um, you know, you, you'll get some stuff you like, you get some stuff you don't like, but you, you will find out the reality of it. And as I said, I've been massively surprised um, by one or two customers this year, just how much they were getting out of their various systems where, because I'm so intermeshed with the technology. I assume what they get out of it is connected to the technology, and that's not always the case. And from a customer perspective, Dan, how do you how do you measure the success? Um, we, we, I'm a bit of a Power BI person. We've been using Power BI linking into SAP for years and years, um, and we've got some very fancy stuff. Um, we've got less fancy stuff about adoption actually of teams i can go in and look at some adoption stats they're not really very helpful um, but some of the work that paul's done with us 
looks at activity management and it gives each individual a, a view on what they're doing it, and there's 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 a, an overview of it um but if you're not so so adoption it, I, I think there's something wrong with the question actually which is sorry to the person who's asked the question <laughs> remember the personally but if it we're not saying to people oh you can stay there or come over here um in our business if you don't come over here you're not part of the conversation it won't be fun <laughs> you know if you sit outside the collaborative systems we use here and that's the video that's the teams that's the crm that's a, a few other bits and pieces we're using if you're sitting outside that it's you're not kind of part of it um and there's there's i'm just trying to think of an example where that's and that because of that, so adoption, that, does that, that might sound a bit draconian, actually, almost like you're forcing it. You're, you're not. There, it's a positive place to come. But actually, people go there because that's where that's where the, the interaction is. That's where that's where stuff gets done. So it's not adoption as in I have a choice because there is no real choice, because if they're not using it, they're, 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 they're probably not doing their job properly and they're, they're not visible, um, which is a performance management challenge, isn't it? Um, so I, I'm sort of challenging the, the, the premise of, of the question, and, but I'm also recognizing the person that's asking has probably sat somewhere, but they've been using a bunch of technology, and then, then we've had lockdown, and suddenly their IT departments go, right, everyone is using this, and you know, it dumps from a, from a thousand miles up, and, and they're asking the why, your favorite question, Timo, the why question, aren't they? And they're going, what the hell's going on? Well, that's not us. We, we, we were there early with Teams, not because we saw any of this coming, but it just seemed like a good idea. So um, adoption's, adoption's an interesting one. And I know I'm sounding like I've got all the answers on adoption. I haven't. There's still things we're not doing properly. Um, trying to get um, particularly salespeople to put forward-looking tasks into a system is, is, has been really challenging for us. Uh, we're getting there. We're getting there slowly because because I think they're thinking, why do I need to say that? Well, because that idea you got, somebody else can help you improve, maybe. Or it might relate to, it might have someone else improve something else over here. Um, so that that we've we've we're still not at the level I'd like us to be there, probably. But in terms of adopting the systems, I mean everyone's 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 in the systems, just to more or less a degree. Yeah, I, mean, I think I always describe it a little bit when I'm kicking off projects. You've got carrots and sticks. You've got carrots, which people like me will hopefully create. We'll create systems that bring people to them. Obviously, people like me can't do sticks. You know, I can't go into a business and say, oh, you must do this. That has to come from the business. Some businesses will do it. And Dan's obviously very good, as we said. And some businesses won't. You know, they, everyone's got a different way to how they do that mixture of carrots and sticks. But if you look too much for all carrot, no stick, it won't work. If you do too much all stick, no carrot, then it won't work. You've got to find the right balancing point for your organization of how good are the systems going to be to attract people into them? And then how much am I going to push people into them if they're still a bit reluctant? Um, and I think that is the biggest one and like adoption's a really interesting one because i particularly in the asset management and property world where people often have to use these systems exactly like dan says you know if you, if you don't use it then you're not clients can't see updates on portals and that kind of thing you're just not doing your job and like we we rolled out systems going back a good few years now but we rolled out a system and it got delayed you know a typical big it project type thing it got delayed by about six months so we did six months of uat and rework and uat rework and uat so we we put a lot of data through the system and then we rolled it out to 80 people and they they put more data through the system in an afternoon on like i think day one or day two of the rollout when barely anybody knew how to use it you know properly than we managed in six months and that was just like you know from a techie point of view just counting the number of records and knowing how much uat we'd done it was just staggering and that that's the big difference i think is that adoption when it's done right people the adoption will feed the adoption if that makes sense if people are putting 20 records on the system in an hour they're probably helping somebody else put 20 record system on the hour it will have happened just because everyone's brilliant it'll be happening because people are helping each other and they're building that adoption and it'll knock the socks off techie people like me because you know if you're doing some uat testing you you can't compete with that you know i mean you you can't even come up with 20 fake names or fake bits of data you know even if you even if you wanted to you're just not really that imaginative um and yeah the adoption builds adoption in a weird way and you and as I said, yeah, finding that mixture of carrots and sticks is pretty much probably the route to success. And uh, I, I'll wrap up with a, with a what question rather than a why question, uh, that, Dan. And it's a question to, to both of you. What's, uh, what's next? 
Um, what's next with uh, CRMCS and PJ Valves? What's the next stage of, uh, of your collaboration? Do you want me to go to first down? Please, Paul. Please, Paul. <laughs> oh, where, where we're really going next is sort of... I'm very interested to what he says. It'll be really. <laughs> I think I'm learning things with teams. We've got the teams integration now, and I think we're pretty happy with it. And it looks to be ticking over very nicely, but I'm sure there'll still be a bit of learning there. But really, then taking that into a couple of different areas. One is doing better, kind of big picture reporting in Dynamics. Um, so I'll see right, what, what's going on for a project and seeing the full roll up view which um, if there's any dynamics people will know the roll-up view will be interestingly debatable, but getting proper roll-up views of information and having that easily available. Having that available within the context of a project or the context of a business partner or the context of a user in the kind of idea of a diary of like, what am I doing next? Making that available in teams as much as dynamics. So that's our element of reporting. And then looking at um, project management, as we've discussed, you know, bringing project management alive. So you've got sales and project management using dynamics. And then more laterally down the road, as I think is kind of a natural evolution to teams, but we're not, you know, it's more, more sort of in the distance at the moment, is looking at how do you then, do you take the, the collaboration of teams with external clients and external suppliers and structure that up? Is it then dropping into teams or do you start looking at portals and having portals connected with teams? Uh, and obviously Power Apps portals is a, for anybody who's looked at portals in the past, Microsoft portals and ADX Studio before that, Power Apps Portals is a far stronger product than it ever used to be um, and far simpler as well. And that will probably be a sort of step a bit further in the future, I think. Yeah, I mean, that, that the last I, I, I'm, re I'm not happy with you there, Paul, because I was going to hijack you with that last one, which we've not talked about. <laughs> so I feel a bit uh, feel a bit hijacked myself. I'm trying to hijack you. Um, no, the, the, the idea is that obviously we've got really good collaborative platforms, extending those to your business partners, which we've done. I mean, we work on a common Teams platform, so so Paul can communicate with me and everyone else, and I can communicate with Paul and, and his guys um, on the, through, through, through a team site we, we, we've got here, doing that with customers, but doing it in a way that doesn't fall into the trap of just being unstructured teams. Um, so introducing that with a degree of workflow will be the smart play. Because just having kind of like IM kind of, you know, it's great for here and now and teamwork, but it's 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 not very good for it's not a great system for for running complex projects. So, it's it's how we it's how we get that to work. That so it's not that the portal is easy. You know, there's 20 products that do that. The the clever bit is the how we do it in a way that 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 brings flow through to our clients. And they're happy to do it as well. And there'll be a different appetite for different types of clients. Um, I'm thinking, but we're we're developing long-term partnerships with clients. It fits directly into that model, um, and 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 uh, third-party suppliers as well. So that that's probably where the, the future goes. There is the AI stuff too, though, um, which I mean I, I've not scratched the surface of, but the AI stuff which picks up the tone of emails, so you can pick up issues and stuff. Um, the whole marketing connection piece that we, we've hardly scratched the surface of. So there's a load of stuff that we could that that that, that's, that looks as though it would that would that would help us. But obviously we need to explore that in some detail. Yeah. Right. You'll, you'll know that one too. Mate. Any any uh, conference in the legal sector will immediately start focusing on uh, machine learning. But we're definitely all growing into that one. It's still a yeah. relatively young industry. But yeah, yeah. Even. But yeah, it's, it's very much coming down the pipeline. We've done a couple of machine learning style projects, simple stuff. But yeah, it's, it's interesting now. You know, it was one of those technologies five years ago. It was like the future tech, where it's becoming more and more the present. It's still, I think, still maybe a little way off. But yeah, it's definitely coming along. That, that was a very subtle way to uh, make you aware, Dan, that you'll be getting an updated proposal from uh, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Just one. <laughs> There's about five proposals in there, actually. Too. Well, I, I'll, I'll send you one as well, just so we know. Uh, brilliant. <laughs> Better in pairs. <laughs> Better in pairs. Um, anything else uh, to add, guys, before we wrap up? Uh, we've got about a minute left um, before, before the, the finish today. Uh, I think it was really insightful. Thank you very much for, for today. Dan, final words? Yeah, I mean, the only thing we haven't covered is time zones and international offices. Um, so there's obviously, we, we talked a bit earlier when we chatted about cultural differences between adoption in different places. But as a platform for an international business, um, 
absolutely fantastic because because obviously you can you can you can fix your workflows and distributed uh, process as well which we do lots of so that that's something we haven't mentioned today which is a real benefit to us and gives us future opportunities in terms of moving into new markets and, and do different process in different places so that's something that we haven't talked about so but but yeah thanks for having me Timo. thank you very much for joining us paul last words from you um, no, I think I think probably have a, <laughs> everyone's used to seeing the sound of my voice. No, no, thanks for everyone for attending, and uh, yeah, thanks Timo for uh, for putting us up. Thank you very much uh, once more. Thanks for everyone that has joined us. It's been an honor and a pleasure, and uh, I wish you a great uh, uh, rest of the week. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.